The South might have perfected fried chicken, but the crunchy coating and juicy meat have been enjoyed around the world for centuries. This is the strange, untold truth of fried chicken. The fact that fried chicken predates the first fast food joints by thousands of years may come as a surprise to many. In fact, the delicious dish was invented by the ancient Romans, as asserted in a cookbook entitled Derecoquinaria. Translating to The Art of Cooking, the culinary manual detailed recipes from the ancient Roman chef Marcus Gavius Apicius, who lived sometime in the early first century. Apicius's Pulum Frontanianum Chicken a la Fronto recipe calls for one chicken, 100 milliliters of oil, 200 milliliters of liquamen, aka fish sauce, 200 milliliters of wine, one leek branch, dill, coriander, pepper, salt, a spice called satire, and a little defritum, a Roman take on grape syrup. The chicken was fried in oil and liquamen and seasoned with saturé, dill, coriander, and leek. It was then transferred to an equivalent of today's oven and cooked for another hour. Once ready, the chicken would be served over defritum and sprinkled with salt and pepper. Although fried chicken is commonly associated with Southern cuisine, numerous historians assert that the recipe for the poultry dish arrived in the U.S. with Scottish immigrants during the 18th century. While most European countries at the time had a tradition of baking or boiling chicken, the Scots had been deep-frying poultry and fat since the Middle Ages. A notable account that traces the roots of the dish is a 1773 diary entry by biographer James Boswell about a fried chicken dinner he had eaten at Cori Kara Chanashin on the Isle of Skye. While it may have been Scottish immigrants who introduced the U.S. to fried chicken, they are definitely not the ones who popularized it. The credit for that goes to enslaved African Americans, who incorporated the dish into their own food culture and gave it the unique twist we know and love today. While Scots would eat their fried chicken without any seasoning, African American women infused the poultry with spices and used their own preparation methods to make the dish. It's this version of fried chicken that eventually became popular in Southern cuisine. Really, the only word for it is... After slavery was abolished in 1865, African American women started using their culinary expertise to provide for themselves and their families. Perhaps the best example of this entrepreneurial spirit took place in Gordonsville, Virginia, where black women were the driving force behind a very special industry based around fried chicken. Despite its population of just 900 at the time, Gordonsville was a key stop for two railroad lines. Given that trains of that era lacked dining cars, passengers had to rely on other solutions to fill their stomachs. While some may have brought their own food, others were more than happy to buy their meals along the journey. Seeing a gap in the market, African-American women started supplying passing travelers with their fried chicken, pies, and biscuits. Commonly called waiter carriers, the women would stand on the platform and hand over their goods to passengers through the train windows. By the turn of the century, the majority of trains had been equipped with dining cars, and governmental regulations had grown more stringent on platform food vendors. This crackdown ultimately led to the end of the unique entrepreneurial tradition. Ever since Gordonsville, Virginia became a bustling commuter center in the latter part of the 19th century, fried chicken has played a key role in its history and development. Today, the town holds the accolade of being the fried chicken capital of the world in honor of the meaty dish and the entrepreneurial African-American women who played such a vital role in its creation. And Gordonsville still remembers its legacy with a plaque that reads, With the introduction of rail service, enterprising African-American women commenced a tradition that was to symbolize Gordonsville forever as the fried chicken capital of the world. The first written account of fried chicken in the U.S. comes from Virginia Governor William Byrd, who used to indulge in the dish in the early 18th century. While Byrd's observations took the form of a diary entry, it wasn't until 1824 that a fried chicken recipe made an appearance in an American cookbook. Published in The Virginia Housewife, the recipe advises chefs to cook chicken as such. Cut the chicken as for the fricassee, a type of chicken stew, Dredge them well with flour, sprinkle them with salts, put them into a good quantity of boiling lard, and fry them a light brown. According to a New York Times article by Julia Moskin, no one has significantly improved the recipe. Interestingly, there's an even older recipe for American-style fried chicken that appeared in a British cookbook entitled The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy, published in 1747 under the title To Marinate Chickens. The recipe calls for two chickens cut into quarters and advises to cook them as such. Lay them in vinegar for three or four hours with pepper, salt, a bay leaf, and a few cloves. 
Make a very thick batter, first with half a pint of wine and flour, then the yolks of two eggs, a little melted butter, some grated nutmeg and chopped parsley. Beat very well together, dip your fowls in the batter, and fry them in a good deal of hog's lard. This finger looking good. Up until World War II, fried chicken was a meal that was only enjoyed on special occasions. Poultry wasn't just a source of eggs, but making fried chicken was also relatively labor-intensive. Unlike today, when we can easily pick up ready-made fried chicken at fast food joints, back in the day, making fried chicken involved multiple steps, including killing the bird, plucking and cleaning it, cutting it up, coating it in flour and spices, and finally, frying it. As a result, chicken dishes were usually reserved for certain events or days of the week, such as Sunday dinners following religious gatherings and the 4th of July. While young chickens were typically used for frying due to their tender meat, older poultry usually went into the pot to make stews. Chickens were also valued by enslaved African Americans as many of them would own and raise them, since they usually weren't allowed to own other types of livestock. While African Americans frequently traded chicken eggs, it's unlikely that they were able to regularly indulge in fried chicken themselves. Over time, African Americans started eating fried chicken as their staple meal after church. They would also serve the best parts of fried chicken, typically the breast, to the pastors who visited their homes. Intriguingly, chicken continues to be colloquially known as the gospel bird or Sunday cluck. While it was black women who perfected the recipe for fried chicken, the credit for the commercialization of the flavorful dish goes to KFC founder Colonel Harlan Sanders. Sanders started selling his southern-style fried chicken out of a small gas station diner in the 1930s. Dissatisfied with how long the dish took to prepare, in 1939 Sanders invested in the newly invented commercial pressure cooker and used it to fry his crispy chicken. While the business experienced many ups and downs over the next few decades, Sanders' empire had over 600 franchises when he sold it in 1967 for $2 million. Today, KFC is the fourth largest fast food chain in the world, boasting over 25,000 outlets in more than 145 countries and territories. The secret behind KFC's success is the chain's signature recipe for fried chicken that blends 11 herbs and spices. While a lot of effort has gone into keeping KFC's secret fried chicken recipe secret, the formula for the dish may have been accidentally disclosed during a 2016 Chicago Tribune interview with Sanders' nephew, Joe Lettington. During a chat with reporter Jay Jones, Lettington revealed a handwritten note entitled 11 Spices, mixed with two cups white flour. According to the note, KFC's famous blend of 11 herbs and spices includes salt, thyme, basil, oregano, celery salt, black pepper, dried mustard, paprika, garlic salt, ground ginger, and white pepper. Many associate fried chicken with KFC's bucket meals, which usually include between 8 and 16 pieces of chicken, and a variety of sides such as coleslaw, mashed potatoes, and fries. The first KFC bucket was masterminded by Colonel Sanders and the chain's first franchisee, Pete Harmon, in 1957. The bundle came with 15 pieces of fried chicken, gravy, and biscuits. The KFC bucket was marketed as a convenient solution for homemakers seeking respite from the kitchen, suggesting that all they had to do to achieve a nutritious meal was to serve the bucket's contents, alongside some salad and veggies. According to a popular story, the KFC bucket was introduced after Harmon bought 500 paper buckets from another franchise owner and used them to package the restaurant's fried chicken. Another account suggests that it was Wendy's founder Dave Thomas who helped design the KFC bucket with the famous red and white striped motif, as well as the iconic bucket-shaped sign found outside restaurants. Standing testament to their popularity, vintage KFC buckets can be found on eBay, selling for over $300. Christmas. In Japan, KFC buckets have become a part of the country's Christmas tradition. Each year, around 3.6 million Japanese families indulge in what to them is a Christmas ritual, as reported by the BBC. And perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. Only 1% of Japan's population is Christian, and the occasion isn't even an official holiday. As such, selling a new tradition, eating KFC for Christmas, wasn't as difficult as it may appear. Jonas Rucka, associate professor of marketing at M. Leon Business School in France, explained in a BBC interview, It filled a void. There was no tradition of Christmas in Japan, and so KFC came in and said, this is what you should do on Christmas. The story of KFC in Japan goes back to 1970, when the first Kentucky Fried Chicken outlet opened in Nagoya. 
The Kentucky for Christmas campaign hit the market in 1974, with a fast food company promoting its holiday season KFC buckets composed of fried chicken and a bottle of wine. According to the KFC website, celebrating Christmas with KFC took root when a member of the company's sales team overheard a comment made by a foreign patron. The individual had mentioned that they opted for the restaurant's fried chicken as a substitute for the customary Christmas turkey. While most of us are familiar with the iconic southern version of fried chicken, there are many iterations of this beloved dish across the world. John F. Mariani may have been one of the first food writers to highlight this fact in the Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink in 1983, when he wrote, Almost every country has its own version of fried chicken, from Vietnam's Gazao to Italy's Polo Frito and Austria's Wiener Backendel. Over the years, different cultures have put their own spins on fried chicken, creating a diverse array of flavors and textures that cater to a wide range of tastes. In Europe, the British eat chicken parma, where the chicken is first breaded and fried before being topped with bechamel sauce and cheese and grilled in the oven. Then there's the chicken schnitzel, a deep-fried German classic prepared by coating chicken breasts in a concoction of flour, egg, panko breadcrumbs, and salt. South Korea has also come up with its own delicious version of the dish. Savory and flavorful, Korean fried chicken is commonly made with goku jang paste, which gives the dish its characteristic fiery kick. Korean fried chicken is also sometimes double fried to ensure that it's extra crispy on the outside. Another interesting take on fried chicken is India's version of chicken lollipops, where drumettes are Frenched, marinated in yogurt and spices, and fried in palm oil. While waffles were already a part of America's culinary landscape by the 1620s, the pairing of waffles and chicken as we know it today was popularized much later. The modern combination of fluffy waffles and crispy chicken topped with warm syrup can be traced back to 1938, when Wells Supper Club opened its doors to patrons in Harlem, New York. Once a magnet for music enthusiasts, the eatery used to draw in big jazz names like Sammy Davis Jr. and Nat King Cole. Since many of the patrons arrived at the joint in the early mornings, after gigs, too late for dinner but too early for breakfast, Wells would serve them a pairing of the two meals in the form of fried chicken and waffles. Drawing inspiration from Wells, one of its regulars, Herb Hudson, opened his eatery centered around waffles and chicken in Los Angeles in 1975. Roscoe's House of Chicken and Waffles is still around and has served such famous individuals as Stevie Wonder, Natalie Cole, Snoop Dogg, Shaquille O'Neal, and even President Obama. The story goes that President Obama ordered the restaurant's Country Boy Meal, a dish featuring three wings served with two waffles, potato salad, or french fries. Whether he opted for the waffle is unclear. Originally, it was just a, a way to, you know, be out there and say hi to everybody. But <laughs> yeah, once we got in the car, it smelled pretty good. In a separate story, another restaurateur who once frequented Wells, Gladys Knight, partnered up with gospel singer Ron Wynan to open Gladys and Ron's Chicken and Waffles in 1996.